Hello, Dr. Dan Guerra here with another excellent, I hope, video lecture in authentic biochemistry. Today will be part one of, I think, a four element series to finish off, yes, finally finish off our discussing discussion of human aging. So I'm naming this the dialectical event ontology of human aging which isn't particularly profound, but I think it does get the message across. Likewise, this is part one. Subsequent parts will probably be named numerically um, in a sequential order beyond that. So let's get started with it, shall we? Now, those of you that have been watching these um, lectures for a long time know I'm going to give you a presentation with PowerPoint which is what I did classically in um, university lecture halls for years. And before that, I used, of course, uh, whiteboards. And before that, yeah, I even used chalkboards. And I think my favorite of all three of those mediums. Oh, and, and when I did the chalkboard, um, and even with the whiteboard, I occasionally used those overheads. Yes, it's overhead projectors. I know, they're terrible. <clears throat> However, that was a long time ago, but I have to tell you, my favorite form of lecture is in an open lecture hall with big windows so I can look outside, hopefully see mountains, trees, uh, and have that lecture be a chalkboard lecture. That's my favorite kind, where there are people there in the room. So it's been a long time since I've been able to do that, but I plan on being able to do it uh, in the future. Uh, as long as someone wants to hire me to do it, I probably will show up and lecture on all kinds of things, as long as it's basically biochemistry, maybe some philosophy too. All right, so that's all, no particular reason I said that. And indeed, um, the fact that I'm doing this um, particular uh, authentic biochemistry, <clears throat> I do have a reason, it's because they have nothing better to do. So let's get started. Now, as a way of introduction, let's decide on a few things about aging. Physiological aging does not proceed according to a specific genetic program. This is obvious because you look at different people, even look at identical twins, by the way, and their aging is not identical. Obviously, environment plays a very significant role, right? So there is a genetic by environment component synergy, and there are epigenomic modifications with the immune system, and I capitalize that on purpose because it's very important, <clears throat> playing a major role in all aspects of the process. These are just general um, precedent statements, which I'm basically using as oh, propositions to an argument that you'll see me develop throughout these lecture series. And I'm not going to go into any more detail than that, because if you listen to my audio lectures and any of these previous video lectures, you know kind of where I'm getting at, right? And plus the title of the talk, the Dialectical Event Ontology of Aging. So don't need, need to repeat that, at least not now. <clears throat> so the rate and extent of aging is an individual process. And, and that rate and extent will itself change with age. Stress and asynchronous periodicity. That means that yes, there is a period to it, but it is not necessarily associated with chronological time. And sometimes uh, it appears that the aging process um, slows down and sometimes even seems to go back a little bit. Now, I'm not talking here about people getting plastic surgery or a facelift or something like that, or getting their hair dyed. I'm talking about the fact is as we age, uh, not so much about the compositional representation of the body, although that also can appear to become younger. For example, in summertime, when people get a tan, maybe get better exercise, they may look younger than they did in the winter. Here's an example. <laughs> but also uh, metabolically and immunometabolically. 
And I will get it into that and explain that later, but you can, I think, start to understand or perceive where I'm going with that. Now to complicate matters, and this is a very complex matter, aging. The processes that drive aging are often inferred from measurements of organismal lifespan or longevity. And I'm gonna define all these things, don't worry. Now that's unfortunate because <clears throat> it's not necessarily the case. So I say from measurements of organismal lifespan longevity, which although clearly related to and determined in part by the nearly ubiquitous process of aging, may be extemporaneously dissociated from the determinants of aging. And yes, and extemporaneously meaning doesn't appear to be associated with any precessional activity. It's impromptu. And indeed, that's the kind of thing that we see in the aging process. That's why it is complex. Nevertheless, <clears throat> within this framework, several general findings and principles currently drive the field of, generally speaking, called biogerontology. Okay. So let's go to the next slide. There we go. Figure this out eventually, probably when I'm um, in my last breath, right? And, and of course I'm aging too. Aging is a process that has an origin and a destination. These are two facts I think I will make clear. It is linked to cellular differentiation, which I'll explain in some detail, and anatomical development, which I think we all pretty much already understand. It starts at conception and throughout gestation, continuing through infancy, early childhood, puberty, adolescence, and all the way through a young adulthood. At that phase of the aging process, terminal differentiation into specific cell types has long been accomplished, although some repair and replacement continues through life, along with simple mitotic division, obviously. However, big caveat here, the developmental program is no longer available. So we know this instinctively and intuitively. If you lose an arm, you don't grow an arm back. If you lose an ear, you don't grow an ear back, right? That's what I mean about the developmental program ceases to be available. Now, subsequent modifications primarily obtain at the level of immunoepigenetic retailering, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system involving tissue repair coupled with post-translational covalent modifications of DNA, RNA, protein, and indeed membrane lipid components, plus an extensive muscle and adipose growth and expansion with lifestyle habituation superimposed upon this genetic expression of phenotype through time, toward a furthering cell fate, including autophagy, apoptosis, and indeed necrosis. Because that's quite a mouthful, but I'll unpack all of this. All right. There it goes again. Here we go. There. Now, during early differentiation, cells gradually become committed. This commitment may be described as a speciation, representing still a reversible type of commitment or finally a determination, which is terminal or irreversible commitment for the cell lineage. Multiple layers of gene program sequences are spatiotemporally organized to obtain the state of terminal differentiation. And there are stem cells which replicate themselves via mitotic division to maintain a precursor pool. Plus, there is an epithelial to mesenchymal cell transition, which we've talked a lot about here in authentic biochemistry over the years, that can be indicted by environmental factors, leading to a rejuvenation of some cellular beds. You see here, I told you about 
it looks like there might be some rejuvenation and a potential for oncogenesis, which often also occurs, especially as we age, right? the production of tumors. There are two mechanisms that, that bring about altered commitments in the different regions of the early embryo. One is spatiotemporal location. So let's get into that. Spatiotemporal location is immediate embryo development wherein the embryo divides without growth or expansion, yet undergoes discrete polarity, driven cleavage divisions that produce blastomeres, and these become separate cells. Each of these blastomeres inherit a given region of the cytoplasm of the original cell. They contain unique cytoplasmic event determinants. Notice I'm not going to call them substances. We don't talk about substance ontology in authentic biochemistry because substance ontology does not describe nature. It's event ontology. Yeah. Now, those cytoplasmic event determinants can include things like DNA, RNA, protein, and of course, lipid, the all-important lipid. Now, once the embryo becomes a morula, which is basically a solid mass of a bunch of blastomeres, it is composed of two or more differently committed cell populations. Okay. Now, it's a lot of detail here, but I'm doing it because we have the time. First thing we have to mention here now, when we're in this phase of cell differentiation is a term called induction. We know it from philosophy and logic. It's very similar in biology. Let's go through this. An event secreted, an event, you notice, not a substance, by one group of cells acting in paracrine results in changes in the development of another group according to receptor-mediated signaling. So already you have a ligand and a receptor being introduced. Okay. During early differentiation, induction is determinative, providing cellular commitment in the presence of the signal and receptor at the appropriate concentrations and time to deliver the response. So you need the appropriate concentration. Here we could be talking about things like KM, right? michaelis menten constant, right, for half maximal velocity. We think about enzyme kinetics. Same thing here with the saturability of any system, okay? Certain concentration has to be reached before any event will proceed. Basically, that's what that means. Inductive events result, result in, should be result in the formation of differentiating cells with each cell type expressing an unique genetic repertoire. You see how differentiation is starting to proceed now. Okay. At terminal cell differentiation, several types of differentiated cells from one population of stem cells is obtained. And this happens during embryonic development and is recapitulated through most of life. Control the process, important here includes lateral inhibition. By this, we mean differentiated cells repress continued identical differentiation of neighboring cells according to a vast molecular gradient, much like waves breaking on the beachhead, having effects on the contours of sand and less and less potency as you move further and further inland. The metaphor that I've used often. Neurons, for example, from the tube of the neuroepithelium possess a surface receptor known as the notch. It's a protein. And, a, and we talked about it many times authentic biochemistry. And notch it, it has a cell surface uh, associated molecule known as delta, another protein, that can bind to the notch of the adjacent cells and therefore activate them. So that's, a, that's the very primordial signaling.
This activation results in a cascade of intracellular events that ultimately results in the suppression of delta production, as well as suppression of neuronal differentiation. The result, the neuroepithelium ends up only generating a few cells with high expression of delta, surrounded by a much larger number of cells with low expression of delta, thus regulating the communication network. Okay. We're going through this very granular, very slowly now, but we're doing it because that's what we need to do. Okay. At the early stages of this discussion. So this is a good uh, pictorial of this. I'm just going to move myself out of the way there. You start off with an embryonic omnipotent stem cell and you get differentiation. I told you there's some mitotic division with self-renewal for the stem cell. From that stem cell, you make an ectoderm, which is going to be the external layer, ultimately, an endoderm, or the internal layer. The mesoderm is middle. And then the, uh, there's another mesoderm layer, which is laid down at the same time. So there are usually two, especially in this kind of differentiation. This is vertebrate differentiation. It's different from other systems, plant and other lower animals, for example. So the ectoderm will give you neural, as shown there, this is the central nervous system. The endoderm or the internal layer will give you the lung. One of the mesoderm middle layers will give you the heart or cardiac muscle. And then the other meso mesoderm will give you bone. Okay. These are the basic initiations of cellular differentiation in the vertebrate. Now, <clears throat> Senescence is something we need to talk about right now. Take a look at this picture. This is a classical picture showing you a young woman. And that young woman has a bonnet on and she has um, her eyes supposed to be here. You can see her, eye, her eyebrow, her nose, kind of an outtake there of her mouth. This is her neck it's proceeding to a dress, right? And these are ribbons coming from her bonnet. But now look again. You can see this is also an old woman. This is the woman's hair, gray and scraggly, kind of like mine. Here's her nose, got a bump on it, the rest of her nose. There's her nostril. There's her mouth, kind of closed, creepy looking. There's her protruding chin. Again, her hair. She also is wearing a bonnet because, after all, she's a lady. And the bonnet's very identical. It has the uh, long trails coming down here. Okay. So, why am I showing you this? Because I want you to understand that that young person becomes that old person. And it's not just an optic effect. In fact, the self will change morphologically over time. We all know this, right? The important point here is how does that occur, right? We don't normally think about it when we're living, even those of us who've had children. You see the baby being born. Once the baby's born, you see the baby started to develop very slowly at first. There's all kinds of things you do for the baby. The baby can't do anything for itself. But eventually the baby starts to get its motor skills up, starts moving around more. Eventually, it actually stands upright, so it's motoring around the tables. Eventually, it walks on its own, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we do see these changes, but they happen pretty slowly, even when you have children, and even when your, your children are mostly grown, like mine, it does seem, when it's all over and done with, to have happened very rapidly, but we know it doesn't seem that way from day to day. The changes are very slow. Now take that uh, image and imagine when you've seen, say, your cousin's children. And let's say they live in Chicago and you live in, I don't know, Boise, Idaho. And let's say you don't travel very often to see them when you do go to Chicago to visit other family members. It's one of your cousins, but you see other cousins more often. Maybe you see their children when they're born, maybe at their christening or something. And then maybe see the children at somebody's wedding five years later, and now they're you know, five years old, they're going starting elementary school. 
And then unfortunately, maybe you see them 15 years later or 20 years later when somebody has died in the family and you go to a funeral. Now they're 20 or 25. They look a lot different. And you've only seen them a few times. Maybe you've seen some pictures sent your way, maybe not. But that big change, you know that that change has occurred and you haven't seen all those developmental sequences. You haven't seen them changing mentally and physically with a have. So that's why I'm showing you this image. So that is another reason to understand that aging, like everything about living, is an event, an event. Things change, things, what kinds of things? All the material that makes up the cellular mass is going to change, turn over, self-replicate, and sometimes terminally differentiate, and sometimes permanently senesce depending on what cell lineage, what organ type, et cetera, it is <coughs> over time. So these are events change through time. The denominator is always T, delta T, right? Change with time. Okay, that's why I showed you this image. And that's why we're already, we started with differentiation, right? From the embryo, right after conception. And now we're talking senescence because senescence is not something that only happens when you're, 66 years old. Senescence starts happening, again, sometimes extemporaneously, sometimes somewhat chronologically or even programmed, but it's happening throughout life. So what do we mean? So the word comes from old man or senex. It's a process of deterioration that is associated with aging. That's what we mean by senescence. It's the biological term. A couple other terms I promised you we would get. Maximum lifespan. That's the maximum number of years that a member of a species has been known to survive. The range is tremendous. So the fruit fly, Drosophila, three months. Human, up to 120 years has been recorded. Some turtles and lake trout, 150 years. And some trees, thousands of years or more. Now you can think you can fill in that gap with whatever zoological species you want to, or phytological species you want to. So that's maximum lifespan. What about survivorship? Different term. That's the percentage of survivors in a population versus their age. Okay. The variation is again quite expansive. Only a small percentage of wild animals, for example, ever enjoy a maximum lifespan based on their developmental sequelae and what we know about those same animals, for example, in captivity. Now that's due to predation and disease. Humans can also be preyed upon, as we know, and humans also can get disease which is going to change your survivorship metric tremendously. So survivorship is low for humans in underdeveloped countries, typically, although this has changed quite a bit. And we'll get into why as we go through these lectures. But it's much higher, typically, grossly typically, <clears throat> and steadily increasing still, the disparity anyway in developed countries now that's not always the case now and i'll tell you right now why because in developed countries we have something called obesity and obesity has to do with the lethargy and the overeating and the lack of good exercise thus inducing a pathophysiological state in a land and world of plenty and obesity is a disease that can decrease survivorship and decrease lifespan along with it. And not only that, and maybe in some ways of looking at it much worse, generating a morbidity that is a disease associated existence for years and years and years before one actually passes with it. Obesity is not something we believe that was particularly common during the evolution of human because we're heterotrophic organisms, food is somewhat scarce. We have essentials we have to obtain from the environment. If we don't synthesize ourselves, that's what essential means. 
certain amino acids, certain fatty acids, certain vitamins and minerals, as you know. Uh, but we're heterotrophic. That means we have to go out and get the food, kilocalories, uh, full stop. We also have to get water, right? And all of that means that we are in constant interaction with the environment. And so what our biology may dictate in terms of aging and lifespan and survivorship is only one element of how long we actually survive. And this is, again, common sense. But understand that as a superimposition on the aging process, because you're not only going to alter survivorship and lifespan, you're also altering the rate of aging by interacting with the environment. And the conduit there, the interaction, is the immune system. The immune system, both the innate and the acquired immune system. Dealing with potential pathogens, bacteria most common, also fung fungi sometimes, parasites, and yes, indeed, also viruses. So those are <coughs> biological um, conditions that can present with disease, but you also have a lot of abiotic factors, such as toxins and poisons, that can also alter survivorship and maximum lifespan and enhance morbidity, leading to mortality. Again, this is all common sense, but understand that that's going to have an effect on what we as scientists, this scientist anyway, as a biochemist, what I mean by aging. Aging is not a universal process. That's what I said, told you at the beginning. It's a very complex process. Yeah. So keep on thinking about this very old woman and that very young woman. Tell me if you don't see both at the same time when you look at it long enough. Some say that when you're younger, you see the old woman. And when you're older, you see the young woman. I can tell you that I've always seen both of them simultaneously. And all I have to do is concentrate to decide one or the other. In fact, I can see both right now when I look at them. So I don't think I've changed in my uh, outlook on life. But again, think about that as what's occurring with each individual human. Start off young and you become older with aging. But that's an event, not a substance ontology. So there's a temporal sequence to it. But sometimes it's not empirically derived simply by looking at the biological conditions and mechanisms whereby you age. That's the important key. Yeah. So what's the oldest living organism on Earth? Well, it's hard to say. We're not talking about bacteria. You know, bacteria can just divide and divide and divide. So if you're just talking about division, you could say the bacteria have been around for billions of years right, from some precursor cell. But that's not the same thing. We're talking about complex, differentiated and developed organisms. And here we're really only talking about vertebrates and only one vertebrate, a mammal named human. Then that's where I really want to emphasize for my lectures, right? Human biochemistry and indeed human aging. But we can ask these questions because it'll give us some relevant understanding of the range of living systems. And again, another important paradigmatic um, rule. And what is that rule? Everything that comes into this world as living dies. There is a time signature on every living system. And it's pretty uniform based on species although it's variable based on some of the conditions I've just been describing to you, particularly about the environment and the effects of the immune system, and then bringing in the epigenetic profiling of gene expression being another major component, all of us functioning together in what I call a dialectical event ontology, which I'm going to explain in a lot of detail throughout these lectures. And I have already talked a lot about this in previous lectures, audio and, vi and visual. Okay. Well, it's living organism on Earth. It could be this 4,664-year-old tree um, that exists in, it's a bristlecone pine that exists in California in the White Mountains. So there's a picture of it. I don't know when this picture was taken, 
you can see some of the debris left behind that fell off that tree. It's probably where it came from. That tree is still living. And from radiocarbon tracing and also from looking at some sections from the uh, core of this um, boral region of the tree, we know that's how the tree is. That's a really, really old organism, right? Now that tree and others that live near it cling to a rocky piece of earth some 11,000 feet above sea level. It's one of the driest places on earth. As you go up in elevation, things get drier. It has to do with permafrost and also relative amount of rainfall and runoff and lack of water holding capacity of the soil. Many, many features. At any rate, con this conifer, it's a conifer, not a deciduous tree, took root. Imagine this, when the great pyramids were going up in Egypt. And 2,275 years before dear Plato, the Athenian master philosopher, was ever even born. That's amazing to me. The tree was already that old when Plato was born. Physical yeah. pines owe their longevity, at least to some degree, according to what we speculate and also what we think has good dialectical evidence to an unforgiving environment. They have an alkaline soil, that means high pH, scant moisture, desiccating winds, constant freezing, and only about a six week to an eight week growing season between frosts. You have insects, you have fungi, you have rot, usually caused by bacteria. And those have, under those very harsh abiotic conditions, a very hard time to establish. So one of the arguments for the aging of these kind of species in these very xeric, very brutal environments is there isn't a lot of pathogenic organisms spread. You go to a forest here at 2,000 feet, 2,500 feet, up to eight, 9,000 feet in elevation in the mountains around where I live, you're gonna see a lot of trees of various ages, and some of them are rotting that are much younger than ones that are not rotting, which withstood whatever pathogenic attack they had, who knows how long ago, hundreds of years ago. A lot of variation, right? But you certainly see a lot more dead and dying arboreal species, that is trees. That's because the environment is richer, and because of that, there are competing organisms. Now, when you think about a human, we have an internal microbiome, particularly in the gut, but we have bacteria in various regions in our body. And these bacteria are commensal, which means we live with them and they live with us. And there is a give and take, shall we say, in terms of nutrition, in terms of metabolic sequelae, also sometimes in terms of regulating the immune response or in protecting what's known by pathologists as the infection court. So we do not live just with our own cells, and we all know this, or we've heard it, certainly. So that's a very important aspect. But yet, humans, would, would humans live to be 4,600 years old? No. Even if they were living in very harsh conditions. We know this because humans have lived in very harsh conditions, such as during the Ice Age, the ending of the Ice Ages in the Northern Hemisphere. And still the age, you know, somewhere between 35, maybe even 25 years, childbearing age for some females, maybe up to 80, 85 years for male and female. Females tend to live a little bit longer than males, all things being said, after childbearing years. There's some good reasons for that, too, biochemically, pathophysiologically, which uh, I talked about in the past and I will bring up in these last lectures as well. So I want to give you some temporal sequence here. That's why I'm talking about it now. Now, what about humans? Now, I've talked about this, and I brought up the same slide. This particular fellow here was named Antonio Todd. He died at the age of 112 in about a month. Now, I told you we've known people that live longer than that. But the reason we bring up Antonio is because he was living on an island called Sardinia. Now, Sardinia is an island right off the uh, west coast 
of the Italian peninsula there in the Mediterranean Sea, right? So Sardinia, Sardinia, as was published in a paper now 20 years ago in Science, has quite an interesting population. More men on that island live past 100 proportionally than anywhere else on Earth. That's correct. Most countries with reliable records, and we do have reliable records of most countries, women reach the century mark off five times more often than men do. Five times more often. So why are men living past 100 years here? Why are these centenarians in Sardinia? Good question, right? <clears throat> now, in Sardinia, you might ask the question, is there a five to one? No. Sardinia, there doesn't seem to be any difference between male and female which is, again, interesting from an epidemiological point of view, biological point of view, pathophysiological, and indeed, ultimately, biochemical. The area is very mountainous, Sardinia. It's isolated, obviously. It's an island, after all. And the population is pretty inbred. Thus, there appears to be a genetic factor. And there has been some work to isolate those genetic factors. I'm not going to get into them now. Maybe I will later. Um, the kind of genes we're talking about here are not particularly exciting ones. They actually are extracellular metalloproteases, as I recall, was one class. Yeah. And, but there's a good correlation between that and maybe survival, which we could talk about. Now, T and B cell immunity. These are two immune cells that are called um, lymphocytes. And they are also part of what's known as the acquired immune response. TMB immunity declines in these individuals, as in all older people. However, the body's innate immunity, which has, for example, macrophages, dendritic cells, and the cinephils, and basophils, and the cinephils, um, is turned on and takes over many functions, in particularly the males in Sardinia. And this occurs after the age of 70, usually when most people are going through heavy-duty senescence, deterioration, morbidity, and ultimately death. So this is a pretty curious event, and, but it goes back to my reasoning of why the immune system sculpts the aging process. And of course, if you know my lectures, you also know that I believe the immune system is involved in learning and the development of understanding and imagination, which are, of course, components um, of the faculties of reason, right? the immune system, a communication network, really, that allows for signaling to occur from the central nervous system to the periphery and back again generating along the way memories which are recorded as an ensemble and then synthesized ultimately to generate justified true beliefs or knowledge bases. Right? This is part of the aging process too, isn't it? And a lot of the biochemistry of learning is epigenetic and actually immunoepigenetic. That's correct. And we'll get into this. Now, you can ask the question, are there general laws that help explain longevity? First of all, there are vast differences in the average and maximum lifespan across the animal kingdom. We already talked about that. Drosophila, remember, mice, human, whales. Now, the differences that span up to five orders of magnitude have actually been recorded. That means the range is from days to centuries. Right? Indeed. However, a, that's, a, that's a major, if you want to consider it a law. Different differential is the law. Second law, maybe it should be the first law. Everyone dies. Everyone dies. Okay. Absolute requirement for living, living ends. Now, these differences depend on developmental genetic programs, as we've been alluding to, 
And what do those programs do? They direct growth, differentiation, and reproductive capacity within a given species. Definition of species is interfertility, right? Now, there are looser correlations between lifespan and anatomical and physiological features, such as the adult finished size, you know, a man, 5'8", 5'9", 6'1", 6'3", 6'5", 6'8", 7'0", whatever happens to be the final adult size, man or woman. There's also some physiological consequence to basal metabolic rate, or BMI. Well, basal metabolic rate is a component of BMI, right? And that all suggests a fundamental underlying physiological and therefore biochemical mechanism. But these are by no means fixed properties. So you can have both parents being over six foot, and you can have no children over 5'10". You can have the reverse. Parents that are 5'8", five, 5'9", five, generating children are 6'3", six, 6'4", six, male and female. How does that occur? Obviously, there's more than the genetic component. Right? <clears throat> right. So that leaves, then, the published literature lacking really any other general principles that serve as rules to measure even lifespan. And you can't do it then with what we could call a physiological yardstick. So we have to do it with different means. And that's what I'm doing here with these lectures. So at first glance, <clears throat> it looks like there are no permeant biological laws to help define lifespan according to an endophenotype that'd be like biochem biochemical pathways such as one that points to bioenergetics or defense, which is just how people typically think of the immune response, or even strict chronicity. Like, wow, you live to be 80, and by 82, you're gone, right? Or maybe 78. Nothing like that. Yes, we have means and medians for age distribution. We've talked about this. <laughs> yes, they've been increasing in the West, and now worldwide and now catching up with everything because of obesity, indeed. But we don't get people who live to be 150 years old. Never been recorded, and it's likely never to occur, not with the given species. Okay. So there is a tr strong genetic, um, I guess you could call it kind of like a uh, boundary. You can die at conception, and you can die up to maybe 120, 125 years. Beyond that, not ever truthfully recorded, and certainly not where you could generate a median or a mean for a population, no matter how large the end number is. And the end number is getting pretty big these days. All right, now, I'm going to get a little bit complicated here because this is what we do. So in the Journal of Immunology, and it has to do with B cell differentiation. So I'm going to put on the magic spectacles here. Starting from a naive B cell from, lymph, from the lymphoid uh, tissue right here, you can see that this cell has certain surface proteins. We call them CD proteins 20 and 27. CD20 is expressed. CD27 is not expressed. It's what the positive and negative sign means. You also have certain immunoglobulins on the surface of a naive B cell. This happens to be uh, a soluble IgM. So IgM usually stands for membrane. So this protein is associated with the membrane. But the little S is there because you can lose it. Okay, you can lose it. Now, given the antigen and an activation by T cells, T lymphocytes, along with a series of other proteins like FTC, uh, well, dendritic cells, and uh, uh, these FTCs is another uh, cellular component of the innate immune response. The two different cell types plus proteins called cytokines. 
you will create in the geminal center, you'll generate a geminal center B cell, B lymphocyte. Then there will be a whole lot of somatic mutation and isotypic switching. This has to do with genetic recombination. Now, that can immediately form what's called the memory B cell, which now does express CD27, still expresses CD20. These are good flow cytometric markers for B cells, as you can tell throughout. But you also have a CD40 ligand, and you also have this POPN1 protein. Notice you still have some Ig, but it's now IgA soluble, IgE soluble. That means you can go; it can be released and go into the serum. You still have some IgM, which is, can also be released. Now you're starting to make IgG immunoglobulin G series and IgD. This is more differential. This memory B cell then can become a non-secreting pre plasma blast, which means it's going to sit there and not do any production. See, no more immunoglobulin, no more antibodies being made until it's reactivated. And the reactivation is caused by antigen presentation, which means involves antipresenting cells, something that has the antigens, like a bacteria or a virus, for example, and then T lymphocytes to enhance the activation. Now, that's one fate. The other fate is you can make an early plasma blast. Notice it has CD27 high, CD40 ligand, but also another surface protein, CD70. You notice that it has basically undifferentiated immunoglobulins. And then when you get to a late plasma blast, you also are expressing BAFF. You still have C27 at high concentration. Sometimes it's called C27 bright. You also have CD70. And you now have POPN isoform 3. And then depending on where you are, in the gut or in the red pulp, for example, you will generate now long-lived, fully formed plasma cells. These are all antibody producing, right? He's producing IgG, IgA, or a constellation of antibodies if they're in the red pulp, IgI, IgG, IgA. You can see that there's cellular differentiation now CD36, CD20, and still CD27 with the double, double positive. You also are making new proteins now, um, BLIMP1 and PEX5. So let's read through this real quickly. I went through the Structural framework there, you can see where the publication is. So naive B cells are activated by antigen and co-stimulatory factors and form that germinal center we just saw, where paramutation of the IG5 region genes, right? This is part of the, the nuclear composition of genetic material in these cells. And you also have IG isotype switching. That means you're rearranging subunit structures to be able to deal after homologous and uh, um, recombination, a constellation of potential immunoglobulins, which because of the high mobility and group transfer during that recombination event, at the DNA level, you're able to produce enough different subisotypes of those immunoglobulins to basically deal with any possible foreign antigen ever created or absorbed or detected in the living system, right? Somewhere around 10 to the 18th to 10 to the 22nd different isotypes of immunoglobulin regenerated by the switching at the recombination level. And I'll have to go through this in more detail when we do immunology lectures, which I might be doing in the fall. Now, after leaving the germinal center, these cells differentiate into memory B cells or early plasma bases, as we just said, and they're identified by an alteration of the expression of CD27, as I also said. Plasma blasts will also arise from memory B cells upon re-exposure to what? Specific antigen, because that's where they were first educated by antigen. Antigen of what? Parasitic infection, which often evade, but not always. 
some preformed antigen that was detected before, and now there's a new invasion of a bacterial, let's say, disease or a viral disease. Well, now get those memory B cells back into being antibody presenting and producing B cells, you see. Now, at the same time, you get the upregulation of a protein called CD38, and that characterized further differentiated late plasma blasts and can migrate to the BM, the gut, the red pulp of the spleen, right? Or to the mucosal epithelia of the tonsil. It's another immune organ. And that's under the direction of specific chemokines that are generated. And those are some classical chemokines. CX, CL12, CCL12, CCL25, and CCL28 are chemokines that are going to be directing the mobility of these cells. Other factors identified support the survival. CD40 ligand, CD70, the BAF app that I showed you up there for the BM. Uh, for, formation, I interleukin-6, and stromal cells. And the phenotypes and transcription factors, which are not shown here, all expressed by each specific stage of terminal B-cell differentiation. Some of those are shown, some of them aren't. Some memory B-cells, some, can also yield alternative phenotypic and functional states, and they will correspond to memory B-cell precursors that ultimately will replenish aging memory B cell populations after long-term non-presentation by the original activating antigen, which was recognized by the recombinant, recombinatorial products of that isotopic swishing, which occurred in the early stages in the germinal center B cell line and all in the lymphoid tissue. Now, there's a unique exception to differentiation phenomena. And the microglia and neurons is something we can talk about in the central nervous system. They consistently undergo immunoepigenetic sculpting. We know this because we understand how neural dendrites interact and they fire and wire together. So neurons that wire together, fire together. And, there, and then conversely, if they fire together, they wire together in conjunction, making networks of neuronal interactomes. Now, that is all a component of the learning process of the individual. And it's the individual that ages not the population. Very important point when you want to understand the biochemistry of aging, which is what I'm trying to teach here. Now, all of that, that immunoepigenetic sculpting is via experience from the environment and also the components of reason that I've been talking about, the faculties of the imagination, and the faculty of the understanding and the faculty of mentation, which make up the components of rationality in the human central nervous system. All of that is associated with the existence of the individual exercising their free choice of the will. Without a free choice of the will, there would be a direct programming of every central nervous system. Apparently via some kind of developmental process so that we would expect each CNS, therefore each brain, and therefore each, if you were a determinist, readout mind would be practically identical, but that's not the case. So for a long time, determinists have said, well, it's because environments are different. But the environment alone being different, how could that be generative for a unique central nervous system without free choice of the will being a component of that system? Well, I can't see any way biochemically 
physiologically or epigenetically. In fact, free choosing induces the immune response, which then triggers epigenomic alteration of gene expression, which correlates well with neuronal speciation and then that gross readout we just talked about, firing and wiring together as an interactome. That is a good explanation for what we observe at the biochemical, histological, and epigenetic levels when we look at the human brain or any brain um, that has the capacity to deal with incoming environmental cues and then rational thought. And the only brain we know that is fully capacitant in that area is indeed the human brain. No other animals tend to have these same um, highly correlated to events in existence that we can observe phenomenon known as free behavior. Right? Something that the behavior of the ecologists and biologists have been measuring and studying now for over 100 years, even the anthropologists to some degree. So we can know this because we have evidence of learning and learning in my philosophical understanding can be described as becoming. So again, if the brain is completely determinant, then we would all learn the same things because we're all exposed pretty much to the same environmental cues, although experiences can be differential. And there yet there wouldn't be a lot of individual human beings. And yet, as far as we can see, every single human being is an individual, phenotypically, medically, and indeed in the process of learning, developing a knowledge base, living through life, aging, becoming more bound with disease and ultimately dying. Each one of those cases is a unique case. So population dynamics can be superimposed on that, but population dynamics, of course, is going to give you a spectrum. That spectrum is because it's composed of individuals. So the biochemical level, true mechanism of constant becoming is the faculty of the immune system. And that works in concert with the plasticity. That means once you make an impression, an impression is left there, such as learning, such as neuronal integration of extra potential firing with generating networks and then interactomes, firing and wiring together, don't you know, neuroscientific principle. But also that same uh, plasticity has to have a component of elasticity, where you make a change, the change occurs in the neuron, and then that change can be reproduced or erased or simply read and cataloged. Now that process is well described in epigenetics. We make an epigenomic signature, such as a methylation and acetylation. For example, a methylation of a cytosine or an acetylation of a lysine residue on certain histones, which make up the chromatin, right? But we can also remove those methyl groups via demethylation. We can also remove those acetates via deacetylation. One of the proteins that carries out deacetylation are called HDACs or histone deacetylases. And those are also commonly known as sirtuins. And we talked a lot about sirtuins in building biochemistry. They're gonna play a major role in a series of lectures as you might've guessed. I'm giving you the granular biochemistry, but I'm also amping it all the way up to the level of understanding that I have of the aging process. I'm just one biochemist, but these are my theories being exemplified in my lectures. I, I write them, I deliver them. So what you see is the product of that, right? But I see no pure determinism in any of the aging systems or indeed in any of the learning systems I've ever discovered or learned my, on my own. And I know a fair amount about the learning process because I have been a professor for well over three decades. I've seen a lot of individual learning events of all the students I've seen over all those decades. 
including my learning processes changing through time. And I can guarantee myself anyway. And from that, it's not hard to make the induction to determine I've seen it in others with both at the level of biochemistry and physiology, but also at the level of the learning process, that there is a fair amount of, in fact, a, a requirement for free choice of the will. That's my argument for it. So anyway, to get plasticity and elasticity of the epigenome. So aging involves fluctuations in the rate of physiological adaptation via an innate immune pattern recognition, like with toll-like receptors, and an adaptive lymphocytic mobilization, T and B cells, sometimes leading to pathological states, which includes inflammatory responses, that can be protective, obviously, if you have an invading pathogen, but if it's uncontrolled or auto-stimulated, overcome or at least or lead to disease states and death at any age. Hence, relevant discussion for aging. Okay. So I'm going to leave you there. We've talked almost uh, 45 minutes, I think, maybe a little bit longer than that. I'm going to get into a discussion next lecture on some aspects of the innate immune response because I'm going to be building up these various systems. I'm going to talk a lot about the immune system, a lot about epigenomics and epigenetics, a lot about metabolic pathways, including those that have to do with anabolism and catabolism. So bioenergetics and also the synthesis of proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids that make up the macromolecular structure of membranes. I'm going to be weaving these different concerted efforts to get into an understanding of the healthy aging process as I continually reverberate and bring back in the brass section or the string section that will lead to pathological events to compare and contrast a healthy aging with which never occurs because we don't live in a sterile environment with aging, including all those different sections of the orchestra that involve pathogens, parasites uh, that alter the aging process and also ultimately autoimmune diseases. Right? So I'm going to leave you with all of that to think about. Sorry, I'm going to move this out of the way. And get to that, which is what I was trying to find to end the um, PowerPoint show. So if you have any questions about what I've talked about today, please contact me. Uh, you can contact me um, at Authentic Biochemistry. You can go to my uh, podcast website. You can also contact me on the YouTube channel by leaving comments there. Um, someplace also you might have my email address. Um, so if this got expansive, I started getting thousands and thousands of email, obviously I would have to change that kind of structure of communication. But right now you can probably do that as well. So what I want to do now is just close. Uh, I remind you that we're doing this uh, discussion um, of aging in the authentic biochemistry productions home. And what I want to do is give you at least three more lectures, video, where I'm going to go through what basically has been almost a year uh, of an axis of discussions relating to aging, epigenetics, the immune system, and what I would like to bring together as a weave structure of the dialectical event ontology of aging onto death. Okay? And that's where we're going to end up when we finish with these lectures. So I promise we're going to continue with the video lectures. I might also do some audio lectures on my Authentic, Bio Podcast, Authentic Biochemistry podcast feed, and those will be representative of, um, sure, correlative discussions related to these uh, video lectures, but they won't be necessary for you to listen to them. But I, I highly recommend that you do, because I can get into more detail in those. 
and I'm gonna be doing both. I'm gonna continue with the video lectures. I told you I've already written this material. I wanna hopefully get it done uh, before um, summer's over, which gives me not too much time uh, because I only have, what, um, five, six days. So I'm gonna try to do a number of video lectures back to back. So this is Dr. Dan Guerrero from Authentic Biochemistry Studios in the beautiful inland Pacific Northwest of the USA. And it is, I guess, the 16th of September, 2021. And I'm saying to you all, um, bye for now.